Hello everyone, my name is Brant Kudrowski and this organic chemistry lab video covers a separation of anison components experiment. This is part three, recrystallization and melting point. Recrystallization is a technique that's used to purify solids. It relies on solubility differences between compounds, solubility differences of compounds in hot versus cold solvents, and the fact that crystals tend to exclude other molecules when they form. Here's an example of an impure solid. This is a non-crystalline solid, I'll label it A, and there are impurities here that are shown with black circles. In recrystallization, you want to add enough hot solvent to just dissolve the mixture. And that gives a situation that looks like this, where I'm representing here all of the molecules being dissolved in a solvent, and the hot plate is keeping it hot. To be sure the solvent is as hot as it can be, it should be boiling. Then you want to allow that solution to cool and crystals of A will form, but impurities will stay dissolved. At least that's the goal. Then you get this result where the A molecule is crystallized, as I'm trying to indicate here with the ordered arrangement of the A molecules, and the impurities stay dissolved in solution. So at this point we have crystalline solid A and dissolved impurities in solution. Now, I'm going to vacuum filter these crystals to separate them from the impurities in the filtrate. So upon vacuum filtering, the pure crystalline product ends up in the filter, and the impurities end up in the filtrate. So this is how impurities are separated. They're filtered away. In reality, recrystallization isn't perfect, and although we hope that all of the A crystallizes out, there will be a little bit that gets lost in the filtrate. Recrystallization is a bit of a compromise. You get a more pure solid, but you lose a little bit of yield. Next, I'm going to talk about melting point analysis. In a melting point analysis, a solid sample is packed into a small glass tube, a capillary tube, and gradually heated, raising the temperature about 1 to 2 degrees Celsius per minute until it melts. This technique is used to determine the identity and purity of a solid by comparing experimental melting point values to known values. Melting point values should be expressed as a range of two temperatures. You'll want to record the temperature when the first drop of liquid appears and the last bit of solid melts. This temperature range is the melting point. Melting point is more than just one number, it's a range. The range tells you something about purity as well. The melting point of an impure solid is always lower than the pure substance. And the melting point range of an impure solid is usually also broadened. If it's greater than about 4 degrees Celsius, it's considered broadened and impure. And with impure solids, sometimes the range can be very broad. When solids melt, they go through multiple changes. At first, they'll be the solid only in the melting point capillary tube. Then, as the temperature is increased, it may seem to sweat. Sometimes they also shrink or move a little bit. This isn't considered melting, though. This is just one of the changes that the solid undergoes as it gets hot. As you increase the temperature, eventually you see the first drop of liquid. You should record this temperature as the first temperature of the melting point range. Then, as temperature is increased, you get to a point where the solid and liquid coexist in a slushy stage. At one point, there might be multiple drops of liquid, or the solid might be sitting in a little puddle of liquid. As the temperature is increased further, the remaining solid is completely immersed in liquid. And then, at some point, as the temperature increases, the last bit of solid melts, and you have exclusively liquid in the tube. Record this temperature, and the range between these two temperatures is the melting point. This slide talks about some melting point tips. Solids should be ground up and packed into tubes tightly. It's important that there aren't air gaps between the particles of solid because air gaps are insulating and you really want a tight packed tube of solid. In the experiment that we're doing this week, we're going to need to seal the end of the capillary tube that contains caffeine. We're going to do that by heating the end in a Bunsen burner. We just need to do that with caffeine and that's because caffeine sublimes. In other words, if we don't seal it, It'll just turn into a gas and float away rather than melting. The machine that we're going to use to melt our solids is called a melt-temp apparatus, and you need to make sure that that apparatus is at least 20 degrees cooler than the melting point of your solids before you insert your tubes. This could be an issue if someone just used the apparatus before and it's really hot. Start the melt-temp apparatus at a setting of about 40 volts out of 120, or if it's got some other scale on it, use about one-third power. The temperature should be rising slowly near the melting point, ideally at 1 to 2 degrees Celsius rise per minute. If you go much faster than that, you might get an artificially low melting point due to the fact that the thermometer just takes a while to come to equilibrium. The reason we have to go slow is so that the thermometer can keep up. That's the end of the part 3 video for this experiment. Stay tuned for the next video in the series where I'll talk about actually carrying out the extractions and separating aspirin and caffeine and binder from anison tablets. 
If you found this video useful, check out the next one in the series or watch the prior video, and consider subscribing to my YouTube channel. My name is Brant Kudrowski, thanks for watching.